Hello and welcome to Talking Gnosticism, our new spin-off of Talk Gnosis. This is our extra informal panel show where we have a diverse group of Gnostics, um, at least diverse in opinion, but diverse in lots of different ways from different communities with different uh, mindsets, with different Gnosis, to share their thoughts on one specific topic. Tonight we are talking about the Demiurge. Uh, this is uh, meant to be you kind of kind of unstructured kind of whatever goes and if you are watching this live uh feel free to ask us uh your questions and to contribute uh, i realize this is the first time we're doing it we're streaming live on twitch i don't know if that's going to go into our programming back end but we'll figure it out mm -hmm. uh so the topic tonight is a popular one that, that we've gotten a lot of requests for even though it's something we talk a lot about on the channel and it is the Demiurge. Um, Rebecca, you are the person I have spoken to <laughs> the least and not within the last 12 months. So, uh, what have we been doing? I know. How are you? What's new? <laughs> so great. Yeah. Um, tell, yeah. Yeah. Then tell us a little bit about yourself first. Uh, everybody will get a chance to do that and then go off queen on the Demiurge. Oh my gosh. Okay. Go off queen. That is me. Um, hi, I am Rebecca Skolnick. You might know me as B. I host Discourse of the Stranger, otherwise known as Dots. It's a podcast through Divine Spark Media, which is creating uh, art inspired by the Gnostic Gospels. And we're kind of coming at things from a philosophical lens, um, from definitely I'm personally interested in, in all world religions and how they intersect and how they differ. But uh, especially we're looking at this through a narrative and storytelling at Divine Spark. So really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, the Demiurge. Okay. Um, I guess I will just start by saying that when I first started reading the Gnostic Gospels and and the um, cosmogony of Gnosticism, it kind of just made sense to me. Like I felt like things were, were clicking. I uh, grew up in the Christian church by choice, actually. I really was seeking something and, and that was the most readily accessible framework. And Yet the more I I grew and and learned and uh, was a part of the church, the more just things weren't kind of settling for me, and so I didn't find Gnosticism right away. But but yeah, something about the demiurge, I was like that tracks of about my understanding or at least my interpretation of of the Old Testament deity, and so um, for me, uh, I know we we do have a a question from through Joanne. So I, I, I don't want to blow up your spot here. Um, but I do, I do think it clicks for me as just a, a lens to view things and, and kind of like a, a philosophical jumping off point. And at least when I compare it to my own religious upbringing. Amazing. Uh, that's my favorite uh, adjective, by the way, but I do mean it. Um, so, uh, you know what, Joanne, tell us who you are. And then uh, I, I believe you have a question from, from Stuart, who, who is based in Australia. Is that right? So so maybe if you can tell us uh, who you are and if you want to share that question, and then if you have an answer for it, uh, uh, go off, Queen. Okay. Uh, well, hi, everyone. I'm Joanne. Um, I'm a co-leader here at the AJC Holy Sophia Narthics in Melbourne. Um, apart from that, though, I'm an archaeologist and ancient historian uh, specialising in ancient religion. So, Rebecca, I'm sure we can have some great conversations. <laughs> Please. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So in terms of Gnosticism, I'm really into the philosophy as well. Um, I really enjoy reading the Gnostic texts, particularly the Sethian ones. Sorry, Father Tony, I know that you're a Valentinian. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so the Demiurge, I think, is a really, really interesting figure from the point of um, view of the Gospels itself, who he is, it's kind of incredibly varied. So we have like a very evil figure, we have some, some a figure that's kind of benevolent, and it kind of ranges all the way in between. So I think we could definitely have a, um, a good discussion about that maybe later on, all of us together. Um, I kind of view personally the Demiurge from more of, of, a, of a platonic lens, so not necessarily a figure that's evil necessarily, but definitely some kind of creator or intermediary between the intelligible and sensible worlds for sure. 
Um, and then I do have a question from uh, one of our group members here. His name is Stuart. And the question I guess would be probably better for a panel discussion is how many of you feel about the demiurge? Is it real as opposed to a, or a metaphor? Um, and the metaphor is that through which we all view this reality. So maybe something to ponder and we can discuss afterwards. <coughs> Sounds amazing. <coughs> Excuse me. Hey, Nick. You know, I'm like, me, Nick, and Tony, if you watch the show, if you're watching the stream, chances are you've watched some of our other programs, so you know who we are. But just in case. Uh, Nick. Uh, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, try I'm trying to think specifically with the Demiurge, how I ended up here. But I think it's because, so my name is Nick Lichetti. I'm here in New York. And so, yeah, um, I wrote a book a while back called uh, The Inner Church is the Hope of the World. Um, you know, it, it kind of came out of my experiences uh, in seminary. I went to Union Theological Seminary here in New York City. Um, I got an MDiv there a few years back and studied modern theology. Um, and then kind of following that, I went into doing uh, digital organizing for the Poor People's Campaign, uh, which is a social justice movement here in the United States, um, and was really involved with the organizing of that, that campaign for the last few years. So the book kind of came out of, you know, uh, a kind of a dialogue between uh, the work I was doing in the Poor People's Campaign, uh, the liberation theology that's really central at Union here, um, and then my interest in esotericism and occultism, which I've been interested in since I was a teenager, um, and never kind of, never really put into dialogue that way until I wrote that book. Um, so I think, you know, one of the biggest influences on me in terms of, of this kind of more mainstream-ish Christian theology has been uh, the theologians William Stringfellow and Walter Wink. And both of them have this theology of the powers and principalities uh, that, you know, on the other hand, I was reading that stuff kind of in a liberal Christian seminary and then um, then studying kind of esotericism and Gnosticism kind of on the side. Um, and, and one of the things I saw was that Stringfellow and Wink have this analysis of the powers and principalities that comes really close to the archons in a lot of ways. Wink even has a book about the archons and the powers and Gnosticism. And then from that kind of the demiurge uh, I guess it's similar to this question from Stuart about being a lens through which to view reality. It really was a helpful, critical lens uh, to kind of connect, uh, you know, some of these ideas about uh, analysis of power uh, that comes across in strength, and wink, and in some of the organizing that I was doing. So I think that's probably where I first started getting interested in those topics. But um, I think, you know, I read about the Demiurge back in high school. I was really anti-Christian in high school. So I, I think I read Elaine Pagels and was like, oh yeah, this all makes sense. Like, all that, but then I got into more mainstream Christianity when I went to college and actually became a practicing kind of more orthodox Christian during that time um, from the Roman Catholic tradition. So yeah, so that's, I don't know, some of that, there's a whole mix there. I didn't even talk about Bataille, like Jonathan wants or Thelema, which I also talk about a lot these days, but there's, so there's a lot more, but I think that's why I'm here. Yeah, and uh, uh, Tony. Hey everybody, Father Tony Silvia with the Upstall Joanite Church. I am the rector of St. Sarah's Parish in Boston, in the Boston area. Um, I also kind of started this thing that we're doing uh, you know, uh, a little while ago. Cool. I like the Demiurge. He's a good dude. No, uh, <clears throat> uh, I actually, uh, I don't know. I, don't, I go back and forth, I guess, on whether, on how literal I see the Demiurge. I, you know, I, I, I think that when a lot of people say, you know, do you believe in a literal demiurge or do you believe the demiurge is a metaphor or is a process or something? It's like, for me, it's the personification of a process. Um, and it's not necessarily, uh, and you know, this is just broad, uh, 40,000 foot view, um, but you know, not necessarily an, an entity or an intelligence the way that we kind of imagine that in a kind of uh, i don't know almost pop cultural sense you know like when we think of spirit and divinity and things beyond the, the physical world i don't think that it has like an intelligence in that way but we can get into more detail on that i think later <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, well, let's do it since um, uh, uh, maybe we can go around and answer Stuart's question. Um, and, and again, or do our best. Uh, the, maybe answer isn't isn't the right uh, the, the right uh, term. Since you know, again, the favorite thing I like to talk about, which is the impossibility of talking about this stuff. But uh, it, on some level, like it, this, this this question is very difficult for me because um, you know, what does literal mean? What does real mean? Right? Uh, you know, the demiurge is not real but acts like it is <laughs> you know that is an answer that anybody knows me has heard me say many times if the demiurge is some real in the way that we understand it uh in our day-to-day -day colloquial should find out how to say that word colloquial use um well what what does it mean to, to be a personality to be a being that is completely different from from what, what we know the word is yes Exactly. Well, you know, I, I mean, I, I had the same question with, with just God and the divine in general, right? Do, do you believe in God? Is God real? Well, well yes and no, but, um, you know, I, I'm talking, you know, I'm an ant trying to understand a, uh, a rocket ship, and particularly when you get into the, the Gnostic ideas of the unknown uh, father, the unknown parent, the, the supreme God, who is, who is a, the Gnostics are quite, uh, almost all the schools of Gnosticism are, are, are quite big on this is a being that's not a being, right? <laughs> so, uh, do I believe in the being that is not a being? Um, so, uh, yeah. So, so, so all I can do is, is sort of spit, spit on the uh, 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 around uh, the demiurge. But whatever the demiurge is, you know, it, it, is it some sort of physical-ish, human-like thing that is like a human but more powerful? Right? No. Um, uh, is kind of thing. Is, is it the sky wizard? No. Although, on the other hand, yes, it is the sky wizard because the demiurge is metaphorically whenever we make an image of God, right? Um, and, um, you know, just even looking at, at some of the classical, uh, I, I know it's the, the Jewish tradition, Christian tradition, Islamic tradition, the Abrahamic faiths, that, you know, even that, that, that strong um, rules and laws and force against idols, right? Which doesn't always work in a pluralistic modern way because, of course, you know, we, we uh, the, many people in those traditions say any other religion is, is idolatry. But I, I think that is still quite relevant for us as modern people, right? Because we make an idol out of God and we worship the Demiurge uh, in a metaphorical sense. So so I, I guess I really like the, the Demiurge as as a metaphor, whatever that means. However, I, I guess at the end of the day, point of, put a gun in my head, I, I guess it, it is, quote unquote, literal or real, right? Uh, even if it is a process. Um, but, but I think there is sort of a danger uh, and I was already talking about this today with Steve D um, uh, uh, on an upcoming talk gnosis that'll be coming out, which is you know, the, a lot. A lot of us have a lot of anger against Christianity. Um, even those of us who had good experience of Christianity, like myself, uh, and a lot of us uh, kind of, you know, come first get uh, grabbed by Gnostic ideas in high school or when we're younger. So the demiurge becomes like uh, like Sauron from the uh, from the Lord of the Rings, right? He he is he is uh, an evil bad guy that we have to defeat to finish our quest. And I think whatever the demiurge is, uh, it's it's not that. Um, yeah, does somebody else want to kind of talk about uh, Stuart's question and, and some thoughts that that, that, that may array, uh, arise? Sure, I'll jump in here. Um, I think something that's interesting for me is this notion of what is real or what is not real. I think um, it, it's public perception and like kind of community agreement, right? If enough people agree that something is real, then it kind of takes on uh, a life of its own and, and a a reality, but do I think it's a literal figure? Uh, I mean, the truth, the spicy take is I don't know. I surely I am not, I am not enlightened enough to know that. But um, for me personally, it is it is more of a metaphor, more more of a lens and a and a story, a way of because that's what I think all of these uh, creation myths are are just our ideas about how we all came to be here. And if there is enough collective agreement around them, then they become real, whatever that means. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joanne, do you, got, uh, do you got thoughts to spit? Yeah, so I should have also prefaced this by saying Bishop Tim was asking us to define what is real in 40 seconds. So I'm glad everyone jumped on that bandwagon. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so I guess I kind of see it more as more of a metaphysical principle, I guess. I don't necessarily think it has to be something physical or tangible that we can experience with our senses, for example. Um, and I guess that's more of a philosophic or platonic view as well. Um, but yeah, definitely I agree with Rebecca. Uh, these stories are kind of meant to be uh, more of an explanation of something that we can't quite grasp or understand, but we have to kind of try and make some sense out of you know, cosmology and how we kind of came to be here. And these are all the, the, these philosophical questions, right? So, yeah, um, I'm not sure, like, I guess as well, yeah, I'm not really sure if the Demiurge is a, is a real being or an entity that we can kind of interact with in any kind of meaningful way. But, yeah, I definitely tend to see it as more metaphorical um, and more metaphysical as well. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my take, I guess. Very cool. Nick, either uh, the responding to that question, or, you know, what, uh, what other people yeah. have been raising? Yeah, I mean, I, I also totally echo, I mean, this this kind of questioning what is real versus metaphorical. I feel like I'm at a point where I don't know what that means anyway. <laughs> so it, it doesn't really work well And I, I, for me at this point. But I feel a little bit like just drawing, again, on, on thinking about William Stringfell and Walter Wink in, in their analyses of powers and principalities that you know, uh, Stringfellow, who's a who's an Anglican theologian um, in the mid twentieth century, uh, saw the biblical ideas about powers, you know, as images, ideologies, and institutions. So, and but when he was asked, is that like a metaphor? They're not really like angelic powers. They're just that's just a way of viewing those things. He would say, well, that doesn't matter really. Like it, they can be ident they can be both powers, and they can be the spiritual powers, and they can be these kind of human systems or these constructed systems because those are real. Because I mean, you know, you want to say an ideology or something isn't real, but it obviously is. It has purchase on the world. It's systematic. Humans individually can't kind of, you know, overthrow it by themselves. Like it's just not. So I think that I think that the question that's important stops being like, is it real or metaphorical? But kind of the sky wizard thing that Jonathan was saying, like, how much are you going to make sure that this lens has purchase in kind of the way we're living our lives in reality, as opposed to it being like a Kind of fantasy role playing, so not that anything wrong with role playing, but that there's like a that you're kind of separating it away from you know the way we analyze uh, you know the systems and structures in our world, and that that to me is more interesting than whether it's real or metaphorical. I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, and it's uh, I still um, uh, haven't done a deep dive, deep dive on Walter Wink, but people have been telling uh, me and Tony to read him for uh, you know more than decades now. No, I think I, I posted. Think on, I, yeah. Yeah, oh, I did eventually pick up um, something, and I got halfway through it and got distracted. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you probably um, did like it while you were I reading did. it. No, I remember enjoying it at the time. Um, yeah. I want to piggyback on on what Nick was saying there, where uh, the uh, there's a there is a usefulness in treating the demiurge as literally real from an yes. esoteric technology point of view. Also, um, you know, like if. if if you want to look at it in like kind of chaos magic terms, right? But the idea of Demiurge can be a very powerful magical tool in and of itself, you know? Um, also, I think as Gnostics, one thing that the ancient Gnostics were doing, I think was kind of this, um, this visionary ascent process that I, I bang on about over and over again, you know, like they were doing some sort of ritual ascent process, which involved encountering the archons and the demiurge as literal figures, like entities that you could see and touch and smell and communicate with, you know, in, in, supposedly. Um, so whether or not these were, you know, akin to a goetic demon summoning or you know something more like a, a drawing spirits into crystals kind of model or straight up you know uh entheogen fueled you know uh, uh you know ritual uh drug use kind of um trip out into the stratosphere so i think that <clears throat> Having this figure that is responsible for all of the, the world's, well, responsible for the world, right? In the Gnostic sense, right? This would be a very powerful figure to work with in a magical sense also, which is something I haven't seen a lot of people doing. And, and uh, I think it's a, a wide open field for um, kind of magical practice. <laughs> 
Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. And I, and I think that, um, and again, if you want to get artsy or metaphorical or Jungian about this, but basically I, I think the, the ancient Gnostics um, summoned and controlled the Archons and then ultimately the head of the Archons, right? That was that was part of what they were they were doing. And of course, I think now it seems a little presumptuous to uh, control the god of this world. Right. But that uh, but but of course, you know, the Gnostics would say that Demiurge is not the god of this world. You are the god of this world. Right. The rightful god. Uh, he's actually usurped your place. Um, although that's actually kind of more of a, you know, the, the, perhaps less Nagamati and more Martinist, uh, where we where we are actually kind of a demiurgic figure ourselves as a rightful. And we are the rightful rulers of this dimension who have been usurped. Again, I think this works quite well metaphorically, or even if you are it's just sort of a, a psychological chaos magician, right? The idea of of controlling the demiurge, controlling the archons, of making them work for you. Uh, I, I think that's the we can connect that to some pretty serious shadow work, right? To going in deep, you know, uh, with, with the ascent. That... Like there's, there's, a, there's a very uh, strong correlation. There always has been between psychological terms and spiritual entities in the Gnostic tradition. So yeah, this, as, as a form of shadow work or as a form of interior path working, I think there's something there. Yeah. And, um, the uh the for 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 your precious gnostic ascent uh there is a recurring um theme and phrase in the uh, uh nag Hammadi. uh to ascend you must first descend right so to make the gnostic ascent you have to descend well what does that mean well one one interpretation is descending deep into yourself into the shadow places right uh echoing the 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 journey of christ down into hell um to liberate uh, the spirits are in hell, right? Um, so, you know, I, I could see some Gnostics sort of taking some of this, you know, you're descending deep into yourself, deep into the realm of the of the Demiurge and the Archons and um, uh, learning how to master them and then ascend, right? And this is also some of the psychological understandings of, of some of the Goetic tradition or of the uh, HGA experience or, or what have you. Uh, a, a question that, that I think particularly, um, I, I think we could all really... Uh, uh, have a lot to jaw on, but uh, Rebecca, you you might particularly like. But uh, again, uh, I was talking to Steve D, and, and he was talking about kind of the um, the negative the negative mythology of the Cephian demiurge, because uh, as we've already touched on, talked about that there's lots of different opinions about the demiurge. He's not always such a bad guy, um, but you know, he talked about it as even even some of the negative aspects as a metaphor for creation and what happens when we create. So creation is is always perfect in our heads, right? In a platonic way, it is the pleroma. And then when we create, it is often by definition, unless, um, unless you are a uh, narcissist, it, it, it's imperfect. So, so as a creator myself, as a writer, right, I, I do know that I have a capacity for uh, avoiding work, for not creating, for uh, procrastinating, because that perfect piece that I have in my head will become imperfect if I write it down. So uh, maybe B, maybe you can start and other people can jump in because I know we have other artists here. But do you see some sort of resonance there? Does that spark anything uh, for you uh, that as a creative? Yeah, I mean, I don't know why you would think that I would be a procrastinator or have a difficult time creating at all. Um, no, it definitely <laughs> sparks a lot for me. Um, yeah, I do think that there, and this is very platonic as well, Joanne, of this idea of like the ideal realm of forms and then having to pull it into the physical and it always loses something and and what is that something that it loses? And even as the the myth of, of Sophia actually birthing Yaldabaoth or, or the Demiurge, it has lost um, part of it. She wasn't aware of what she was creating in reality. And so I think as a as a writer, there is this, every writer will tell you, you just have to let it be bad. You know, you have to get the first draft out there. You can, you can wait, you can procrastinate, which for me is a, a form of perfectionism as well. You know, we don't, we don't want it to be bad at first, but you have to get the first draft out there. And then sometimes that, like, if you're just putting work out into the world, uh, and it doesn't have to be anything, then sometimes you do just have to throw your hands up and say, okay, this is not the perfect form, but it is done and, and here it is. And, 
and we can go now we can work now we can go from there and i actually think that's a really beautiful metaphor for the world itself of saying the world, the created world is never going to be a finished product. It's never going to be perfect, but that doesn't mean that we can't do our work while we're here. That doesn't mean that we can't um, start the creative process and then edit while we go and, and destruct and construct again. So I do think that's a really beautiful, a beautiful metaphor for looking at the world. Um, and about the descent and ascension, uh, I've been working a lot with the Gnostic Gospel of Mary and this, the teaching from Yeshua that was just for Mary that she shares of the soul really coming up against all of these forms of wrath and these powers. And so, Tony, what you are talking about um, really resonated with some of the deep dives that I've been doing personally and then, you know, on dots with, with the gospel of Mary and how it is a descending into the heart and into the self in order to really go on this ego journey, whatever you, whatever terms you want to put on it, um, of the soul kind of meeting all of these powers that are, that are real in our lives, that are real experiences that we will come up against, um, and that we will continue because it's all cyclical until, until we move on from this world. Um, but yeah, the, the creation and, and just letting it be formless is, is an important part of the process, I think. Yeah. Oh, also, yeah. The um, as a as an artist myself, I find that um, reminding myself that the physical world, just by its nature, is imperfect, is very helpful. To just be like, oh, okay. I, I you know, um, I studied uh, Native American history in college a little bit, and there was this one particular tribe, and I'm not going to remember which one it is, so I'm not going to try, but they, uh, this particular philosophy struck me as they would intentionally, in all of their crafts, you know, and all of the, the, you know, decorative work that they would do on their, their personal items and things, they would always intentionally make at least one mistake because they felt that perfection was, was not for them. It's reserved for divinity alone and that we can't even approach it, so why even try? And that that has been, um, you know, that has kind of lived with me uh, in my in my own personal theology, and uh, helps me get a lot of things done. <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't otherwise. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I believe there's also that's in Islamic cultures as well. I think there's some Persian streams. Uh, it might even uh, might even be Persian tapestries that says the same thing, right? Perfection belongs only to Allah. So they deliberately put a flaw in. So. So that's uh, that's fascinating. Um, something practical for the demiurge is um, when thinking about it as as an actual entity, uh, which I think is helpful. Is, is of course it just keeps us honest on our spiritual journey because I, I do believe the Gnostics do have to constantly, and it's exhausting, right? But we constantly have to be critical of of Gnosticism, critical of our own faiths, critical of our own communities, and critical of our own journeys, right? And we do have to ask ourselves when we have an insight, when we have a vision, uh, when we see God, when we have a great idea. You know, is this demiurgic? <laughs> you know, is that is that is that who I'm seeing in my great visions? Is is this who I'm seeing when I'm doing this imaginative work? And it's hard, and it sucks, right? And and I wish it was easy, but you know, as a great man once said, you know, Gnosticism is 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 not a uh, is not an easy religion, and and if you're not up for the challenge, you should you should go, you know, do something easier. Uh, that's I'm paraphrasing Father Tony there. Um, the uh the, the other thing i'll shout out that, that maybe nick can 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 speak to um which is uh, uh lately and and regular watchers of the show will will know this uh, i've gotten quite interested uh, even more interested in psychoanalysis um and in um uh what's sometimes called negative psychoanalysis or uh dr julie resch has necro psychoanalysis which you're probably catching on is um not uh that cheery i'll actually read from uh from dr Dr. Julie Resha, which is, we are the living dead for whom committing suicide is less painful than to go on as heroes, the survivors of our lives. But all the most unbearable suffering is worth it because of what we are at the end of this deadly path, a collection of scars that our lives left us with, beautiful revolutionary monsters. Only those who are not detached from reality, who don't escape the great pain of facing it, retain the power to change it. So I, I don't think that this is plunging into... 
uh, misery for the sake of plunging into misery. But I, I think that the Demiurge, you know, is a great way to understand and to confront the horror of reality, uh, the terror of the real, the the lack, the fact that we are divided um, and broken creatures in some ways and live in a divided and broken reality, where we find even if the Demiurge is a symbol, even if the Demiurge is not literally real, you know, the Demiurge is still fractured God. Right. And it is it's particularly in the mythological sense where, of course, you're taking well-known aspects of God from from primarily um, uh, Hebraic mythology, but also other mythologies and saying, no, it's actually like this, 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 this broken creature. But God is broken. We are broken. Uh, we are broken and divided. The divine is broken and divided. Uh, so is life. So, so Nick, I was that also uh, made me think of of Bataille. And of course, you sort of wrote an article uh, a while back about Bataille and um, uh, uh, the demiurge. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that article, a little bit about some of that thought, and just bum us all out. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> that's a lot. Well, so with Bataille, I think. Yeah, I, so I've written a little bit of Bataille. Bataille is really hard to grasp sometimes, so I feel like there's a little, a few things here. Um, I think I wrote two pieces about Bataille. One was actually about um, a piece that he wrote called Base Materialism and Gnosticism, which is not a very good historical view of Gnosticism, but is like an attempt to use some Gnostic motifs for sort of this philosophy of base materialism that he was developing. And then I think I also wrote a piece about Bataille and, and Aleister Crowley in the Philemic tradition. Um, but there's a few pieces from what you're saying that I think really connect, which is um, maybe not quite about the Demiurge specifically, but just about Bataille's philosophy in general, which is this need to face kind of this horror and, and kind of torture of life in some way. Um, and that, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're continuous beings that have become discontinuous in Bataille in some way. So a lot of his ideas and a lot of the practices he was interested in was about how to regain that kind of continuity, which always reminds me a little bit of both Gnosticism and Martinism um, as well. Uh, so, you know, and Bataille had a whole method of meditation where, and this it's where it's like, it doesn't seem super healthy, where he would stare at photos of torture victims and sort of try to put himself into that, similar with the cross and, and the crucifix. And it would be about this kind of, um, again, this kind of like the, this ecstatic experience of this, the shattering of this this uh, individual self to be part of the, the the continuity again. So, and a lot of the things he was interested in, this, the various forms of transgression, whether it was like, you know, that in that case it's violence. He'll talk a lot about sexuality. He talks about playing baccarat in one one part in one book. <laughs> like it's, he, anything that can kind of reconnect you with that primordial continuity is stuff that he was interested in, and that could take really extreme forms. Um, so I think that that that's one kind of area where it would where it would connect. But interestingly, in the one place where he does talk about Gnosticism, he kind of puts himself as like a pro Archons person in a way, <laughs> but not because you know I don't think he was quite understanding all of the ancient theology there, but because the idea of base materialism was to see that base matter, what he called it, is this kind of pure, um, you know, undifferentiable kind of uh, you know prima materia that. Uh, kind of overturns any attempts to divide it up into either ideologies, like totalizing ideologies, or to kind of make it into these discrete entities that that lose their continuity. So it, when the demiurge traditionally having like created matter in some, you know, in the kind of popular understanding that like matter is bad, not that I know it's way more complicated than that in Gnosticism, but for Bataille, it was like, no, matter is actually this vibrant, uh, vibrant kind of thing that that can overturn all of these attempts at categories that we make that then restrict us. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where he kind of comes at it. But I don't know if you mentioned the Demiurge in particular in that way. I think for him, the Demiurge, maybe this gets into the stuff that I always talk about, which is uh, lately, which is Thelema and the, the figure of Karanzin and Thelema, which to me is also a Demiurgic figure. Um, I think what Bataille would say if he was thinking of a kind of more negative Demiurge, like we were saying about the Demiurge in creation, this figure of Karanzin and Thelema is both a, a, a point in your kind of spiritual journey, but is also this kind of metaphysical figure that represents the maker of forms. And whenever there are forms that are created that you kind of put too much purchase on as being kind of inherently substantial, um, you know, and, and you kind of become ensnared by that, that's a, that's a problem that kind of breaks you out of this continuity. So I think that Bataille actually has some, some connections with Philema in that way, more so than with ancient Gnosticism, just because of where he's coming from philosophically, but yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. And, and, 
Jonathan, your microphone is out. <laughs> it's the Demiurge. Live TV, everybody. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Talking about a lot of stuff. I'm not sure in in which reference that was, but it just the whole topic of the Demiurge for me is so, so humans are where the universe goes to work out its contradictions, right? We we are how the universe works out its contradictions. And of course, once you're talking about the reconciliation of opposites, you're getting into alchemy, right? At least uh, spiritual alchemy and uh, getting into the alchemy of, of Carl Jung. Um, so I, I think, you know, this, this idea, uh, this alchemical approach to the Demiurge instead of just Demiurge bad, right? Of Demiurge being the, the, the dark soil of matter from which something can grow. Uh, the is the mask of of the true divine, or uh, if you're going to talk about the fraternus, uh, uh, Sat uh, Saturni, uh, the the Saturn fraternity, uh, you know they talk about the demiurge being Saturn, but it, it's 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 bad. It's not great. Uh, it is the demiurge, the bad one that we're talking about right here. But it is a necessary darkness that we have to work through to get through to the truth. So I I think kind of and i know these are concepts that we're we're kind of have already touched on but to make it into something cohesive i think a lot of alchemical concepts do do really help us here um uh so uh, the father tony um and, and he actually uh, uh, said a braxis slash demiurge um and uh, for those who don't know, Abraxas uh, is 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 a a character uh, like Baphomet, uh, who has the the head of a chicken, uh, has snakes for legs, the body of a human. Uh, so is this 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 figure that that reconciles um, uh, opposites and and. Uh, it, in different schools of Gnosticism, Abraxas is sometimes the demiurge uh, in a negative sense. Sometimes Abraxas is a positive demiurgic figure. Sometimes Abraxas is an archon that was redeemed and switch over to the good side. So, so lots of kind of fascinating stuff to to think about there. But um, uh, Tony uh, went into one of my, unfortunately, he brought up one of my favorite topics. So I got a rant about that. And then people can add to that rant, uh, which is the demiurge and anti-Semitism. And this is, this is a bit of a bugaboo for mine, because I'm not going to say that most forms of Gnosticism are Christian, right? And that is the, the was and, and is the dominant form, uh, if you're going to look at the numbers game. Um, and if you're going to talk about Christianity in general, then you're going to have to confront some anti-Judaic and anti-Semitism, uh, right? So I, I don't think that that Gnosticism has any extra issues related to anti-Semitism that Christianity in general doesn't have. And if you're sort of looking for answers... And scholarship, you know, we've had a lot of 20th century and and 21st century, and, and of course, also way before that, uh, theologians and philosophers, both uh, Jews and Christians, sort of tackling that. So I, I don't believe that the Gnostics were saying that, quote unquote, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Jews, was the Demiurge. I think it's much more sophisticated than that. And if you read something like Secret John, which I think originally came from a Gnostic Jewish community, that, uh, you know, th this is now out of um, vogue in. in in scholar in in most scholarly um, uh, circles, but uh, it shouldn't be because it's the truth, uh, and it's we it's we basically have proof for it. <laughs> um, but uh, whatever, um, it, it and that's the one that really kind of has the the sort of archetypical Gnostic myth and this negative figure of the Stephian demiurge, but. The demiurge is not the god, quote unquote, of the Old Testament. If you read. Um, Secret John carefully, what they've done is if they've they've taken this one god and broken it into all these different figures, right? So you have the unknown father, you have the Aeons, you have Epinoia, you have Sophia, and you have the Demiurge. Where if you're just looking at some of the source material, oh, okay, you got, you know, this this one guy, even though of course, you know, it's much more sophisticated than that. I'm I'm sure as 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 Nick knows from uh whenever he was studying the Tanakh in school. <laughs> so um so th that's what I got to say about that, but that's just my rant on it. Does anybody else here have, have anything to say about uh, Gnosticism, the Demiurge, the, and the Demiurge as an anti-Semitic figure? And, and that said, there are anti-Semites out there that, that 
have created their own form of Gnosticism. I'm sure it's, I don't think there's any organized groups, but they're, you know, losers in their basements. And they're, and they're saying, hey, this ancient tradition says that the God of the Jews is a bad guy. Um, so, so there are Nazis out there doing that, but, uh, you know, it's not the majority of Gnostics and it's, they're yeah, not. Yeah, we haven't had that the same way that, that the, uh, so sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Go off anybody. The same way that the pagan uh, community has kind of had to deal with the uh, neo-Nazi issues. Oh, Father Tony, I can't hear you. Can other people hear them? I don't know if it's my bad tech again. Yeah, I think okay, it's, it's my bad tech again. Uh, so <laughs> but just I talk. do think there is, yeah, I do think there is one specific way that um, Gnosticism kind of has a, a black mark in its favor as far as anti-Semitism is concerned, and that's Marcion. Now, one can make an argument that Marcion isn't strictly Gnostic, but I, I, I think that you would, one would have to be forced to say that Marcion believed the God of the Old Testament was the evil demiurge. So um i it it can happen like this and it's not a it's not a very very big uh, intuitive leap to say the way that i'm reading these texts they're obviously talking about the god of the old testament and they, this is an obviously bad figure therefore anybody who worships the god of the old testament must also be bad right but that's the that that's not necessarily true right like you're not that's not it that doesn't follow from the evidence so one could so let's say you have the most um the the most anti-cosmic uh sethi and gnosticism that you could possibly have right say you're the most hardcore world-hating dualist that the world has ever seen um and you believe that the the demiurge is literally the god of the old testament um you have to then say, well, almost everybody who believes in God in the way that people believe in God today believe in the God of the Old Testament in some form or another. So it would put you in a very um, unpleasant mental place, I think, to, to follow through on that and say, oh, therefore, I am the only one who is right and everybody else is wrong and evil, and I have to fight them, right? Like, at the 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 literature can lead a person there, as you say. Um, so I, I think that's for me. That's why I practice Gnosticism communally. You know, I know a lot of people like to practice Gnosticism by themselves, and it makes a lot of sense because it is a, a very kind of individualistic thing. But but for me, it's that kind of like having other folks to check what you're doing um, is is very helpful. Me. Yeah, I've gotten way off topic, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that this is this is the extra. You know, I already tell people that the Gnostic wisdom and talk gnosis is, is the rant network, right? But this is supposed to be extra. Go, go off. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, I, I, you know, that that's actually brings one of my favorite topics about particularly with esoteric and mystical religion and especially with Gnosticism. So all three of those, uh, uh, the, the community is good because, uh, it, it does, it, it, it helps. It, it stops you from being a crazy person. Right. And it also is like, if you are getting downloads, if Let's you are crazy, yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, uh, I don't mean that uh, no pun intended, but yeah, it doesn't yeah. stop you. You know, no, yes, good point. I've had, I've had many a dry erase board full of like Kabbalah, Gematria, and stuff like that, and diagrams of the cosmos. So, <laughs> good it, point. It doesn't and also depends on what community you're part of. That that's true. That's this that's one is not true. helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hypothetically, <laughs> it's good to keep you in check. Um, and to to balance off your personal notices, uh, which uh, which as I said, even if you are getting downloads from the demiurge, you know can you, can still uh, 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 go. Um, uh, Joanne, you uh, you mentioned uh, uh, being really into Plato, but Sorry, did you say you lean title idea? Downloads from the demiurge. Okay. Good. Oh. Perfect. Done. Okay, that's our new spinoff. Uh, Joanne, yeah, you mentioned being uh, uh, really into Plato or, or uh, the, the the Platonic thought. Um, so, do you lead more towards you know the the, the demiurge of the Timaeus uh, because or or the the demiurge that is that is flawed but is not a bad guy that is a necessary process or kind of if you could tell us a little bit about you know some of your Platonic understandings and and where that connects in. Yeah, sure. So. Um... In Australia, we've been looking at a bit of a deep dive into some of the Sethian texts, and it's kind of interesting to see within those texts or within the Sethian tradition more broadly, 
that there are very different iterations of what the demiurge is. And, you know, we're talking a little bit before about anti-Semitism. And I don't necessarily think that's the case in, in a Sethian context, because it's obvious, like when reading the text, that there's a group of Hellenistic Jews interacting with Platonic ideas, and then it kind of gets smushed together. And that's what we get um, in, in, this, in the Sethian text anyway. So, um yeah, I guess also we can talk a little bit about Neoplatonism as well. Um, there's some scholarship out recently saying that uh, Plotinus was actually a Gnostic before he became a Platonist, and that's kind of where those ideas came from. And that's kind of yeah, that's how uh, Neoplatonism kind of got those um, ideas about the divine realm. But um, yeah, in terms of the Timaeus, it's kind of like the demiurge is this very benevolent entity. Um, as I said before, he exists in, as this kind of intermediary. He's kind of like the person or, or the entity that's responsible for creation, but he's taking that blueprint for, cre for creation from the realm of the form. So um, there's nothing evil about it. It's, it's kind of a very innocent um, and loving process as well. Um, he's, you know, the divine craftsman who's crafting the material realm and the cosmos, the universe from this kind of, uh, higher divine principle. Um, so I think, yeah, it's it's really interesting when we look at the texts themselves and how uh, these ancient Gnostics are trying to reconcile those ideas and kind of bring them into into form as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's pretty much the crux of it, really, in terms of Platonism. Like, you can go and read the Timaeus. It doesn't say anything about the Demiurge being evil. And I think um, the Sethians get a bad rap saying, you know, they're dualists and they hate the world. And that's just not really the case when you look at the text. Um, but I think, yeah, in a kind of ancient context, the Demiurge is used as kind of like a scapegoat figure. He's kind of uh, blamed for all the evils in the world. But when you go back and read the text, um, he's not an evil figure, really. He's kind of, I guess we can go back to the Apocryphon of John, for example, He's a being that was created by the ignorance of Sophia, right? So it's kind of like he's innocent in this situation. He's born of ignorance and he's kind of hidden away in a luminous cloud and kind of has to figure out life for himself. So, um, so yeah, I guess he, he can also be seen as a metaphor for ourselves as well. Like we're like dualistic beings. We have a material form, but we also have spiritual component. And I think the, the spiritual journey of life is learning how to not be ignorant in ourselves and, you know, going back to the whole Jungian thing, um, being self-aware and kind of working on ourselves. And uh, and that's, I think, the, the spiritual descent and ascent that we were all talking about before as well. Yeah. There's um, some threads on there that, that I would like to pull on and then, you know, uh, I, I hope some others will as well. But uh, that, that Jungian idea of the Demiurge, because I think it's it's fairly obvious in the Apophraganachan and Secret Chan that, that it can be understood in a couple of different levels, right? And that this is, you know, he's literally talking, uh, the writer, uh, they, I should be saying, they're literally talking about a, a giant primordial brain at the beginning of existence, right? And these are psychological processes that happen within the mind of the the monad, within the pleroma, but uh, obviously also happen inside of us. So the the idea that it that it's at least partly a psychological metaphor for for ourselves that we are the demiurge uh that the ego is the demiurge the, the small self as, as some christian mystics call it uh we have a small self that we overly identify with and then we have the deeper broader uh uh self that's identical with with the divine uh do, do other people uh believe that find that helpful uh look at that in that that Jungian way in sort of a practical uh, psychological sense that uh uh, hey, you know, my my egoic identity is the demiurge. Does that work for anybody? Anybody else want to riff on that? It's all fair. I guess we don't have to because it's all fairly obvious, huh? <laughs> you know, um, and, and I think a lot of contemplatives, and we've talked with, with Bishop Tim, you know, the, about that this is not just, hey, that's cool. Right, uh, but this is becomes practical because we can look to Secret John, uh, uh, partly as a guide for contemplation and meditation. Right, partly as a guide for living our lives. Like we don't want to be the demiurge. You know, what is it that the demiurge likes to do? Um, which, you, as Bishop Tim and others have pointed out, is control. 
right? Um, the Demiurge is very much about control. Um, but I think also as a psychological metaphor, Joanne, I mean, you hit it right there where, you know, we're, we're talking, the Demiurge is not the devil. The Demiurge is, is not evil, quote unquote, for no reason. But when we're looking at psych psychological metaphors, why is the Demiurge the way that it is? Because the text, Secret John doesn't say, like, it does say the Demiurge comes out misformed. It doesn't make any value judgments on that, right? If I don't Sophia think, had... I don't, I don't think the Secret Book of John was written by, from, well, I, I I don't know if I really believe this, but I'm saying it right now, that the secret book of John was was received as a divine revelation and then written down. I think it was written from the inside out. I think it was somebody observing psychological processes, projecting them out into the political landscape, right? Because there's still a yep. lot of political uh, commentary that's happening in these social documents as well, you know, like these scriptures. And then projecting that further back out into the the, the world of um, the world of the divine which is a very gnostic thing to do right like creating god in your own image <laughs> yeah so yeah the demiurge is your your ego right like to put you know to put it far too simply but you know um when i find myself kind of having egoic thoughts right like i try and i i try and notice that and i say Okay, because usually it takes the form of me giving a lecture to somebody. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> everybody kind of has their thought patterns. For me, I'm always teaching somebody something. And so, like, um, whenever I find myself teaching in my head, like, I'm like, who am I talking to is what I say to myself. And I'm like, oh, I'm talking to some imaginary, like, interviewer or something when I'm famous. And I'm like, ah, there's the ego. There's the demiurge. That's, that's uh kind of one way I use that kind of psychological model of Gnosticism in, in my daily life. That's really cool and also very practical. Yeah. Um, I was just gonna say, I think connecting to this idea that it's you know related to the process of the ego and then and then Father Tony mentioned the political side in terms of Gnosticism that um, you know it's also these fixed ideas and <clears throat> kind of ideologies that are themselves powers within society that then we kind of take on as having you know, an inherent part of our existence, which I think is, there's a lot of things in esotericism and, and Gnosticism that we could read as a process of like kind of unlearning and, and you know, it, it, taking apart those kinds of fixed ideas. And so I see that as, I mean, a lot of our ego is, you know, I guess a collection of identities that we've received from society or, you know, culture or whatever. And that just kind of getting through that or sorting our way through that, um, you know, also as part of that process. Um, and that there's a political connection to that because all of those things come out of, you know, this gets closer to like Marx or something, but I think Jonathan said earlier about the demiurge and the projection of ideas about God. Um, so, you know, how much, how many, how many of these things come out of complexes that are actually kind of constructions in society about God and family and, and gender and race and all of these things that we yeah, the kind of overlaid on this. As, as a political and psychological metaphor, yeah. 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 Well, they, you know, if you think about what, what is the primary metaphor for um, uh, in, in Christian mysticism, right, is is resurrection. But the word that is used is to become awake, to wake up. Right. Uh, and that is also the primary metaphor in left wing politics right now. Right. Um, to to awaken. Um, and again, the, I'm going to use the M word metaphor. But, you know, if you look at Secret John, the, the, this is also a political story. Right. The the, uh, the as Karen King points out, uh, Secret John is, is a satire and others uh, is a satire upon the Roman Empire. Right. And the Demiurge is a satire upon the emperor. And I say that this is the. the this okay this called is called archons it's a it's a yes. you know a, a term of art for a ruler that they would have encountered in their you know daily lives and would have had to put up with it's, it's much more obvious in context because it'd be like writing congressperson <laughs> you, know, you, you know or mayor oh, we or gotta start doing governor that. we gotta rewrite all the gnostic texts and every time it's yeah. archon we gotta say congressperson yeah yeah, because your archon it was the local ruler, right? So the, the metaphor becomes, or as I said, it's not a metaphor because they believed it literally or whatever. If this stuff is literal, it, it would have been much more obvious. And you know, the, they believed that the powers of of, of this earth um, were were controlled by by those negative powers, and we're also structured like those negative powers, right? As above, so below. So the demiurge very much is like a corrupt emperor surrounded by his governors, the archons. So, um, so yeah, there's there, there's a lot there, a lot of levels when 
we're when we are sort of uh, doing a little bit of uh, political analysis, which again I think doesn't you know I think for a lot of people and for the people who are centrist or, or lean right that's fine. I don't think it necessarily has to be left wing analysis because it's just how it's just power right. And of course you know uh, there wasn't a right wing and a left wing uh, almost two thousand years ago. Um, all right, uh, I'll go back to to, uh, to to a rant I was getting on about the creation of the demiurge, which is, you know, Secret John is partly a guide about how we don't make more demiurges, right? As in little demiurges, as in us. How, how do we not make egoic narcissists? So, Sophia, like, there's no value judgment when when uh, the demiurge comes out misshapen. And perhaps if Sophia had just brought the demiurge into the the song of uniting that is uh, the, the dance of the uh, aeons, then everything would have been fine. Right. Uh, but of course, if you if you push out those that are different, or quote unquote, misshapen, uh, if you hide them away, uh, if you uh, don't raise them with a lot of love, if you don't raise them in community. Right. If you raise them in isolation. Um, and of course, uh, Sophia creates a demiurge because she tries to do something outside of community. Right. So I think that this is talking about how do you get isolated, neurotic, narcissist uh, control freaks? <laughs> um, hey, I'm right here, dude. <laughs> well, I got some words about the unknown father, but fortunately, he, he, he doesn't watch my podcast, so it's good. Um, OK, <laughs> so that's that's the uh, you know, that's a different unknown father. Um, the uh, uh, OK, I'm. Uh, somebody say something smart quick. Yeah. Can I hop in? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so this idea of, of evil or ignorant, I actually think for me in terms of a narrative and in terms of looking at character and looking at psychology and looking at ourselves, it's not as interesting to me to, to view it the demiurge is evil. Actually, yes. ignorant is way more um, my vibe, way more my jam, because uh, it, we have a negative connotation to ignorance in our society as it stands, but ignorance is simply not knowing or not having awareness or or a lack of information. And so there, and I see we do have a, at least on my, we have a comment that says, does the demiurge uh, deserve compassion? And I think that going off of your rant about the idea of, oh, there it is, um, the idea of of not allowing these misshapen individuals to be without community or to be raised alone. I think it reminds me of a Nordic fairy tale called the Lindworm. And it's of this queen who really wants to have a child. And so there are magical components to this. And uh, ultimately the, the child comes out as this horrific dragon figure and she banishes him to the woods and he mm. grows in isolation. It's very, it's very, Sophia and Demiurge, um, he grows in isolation. And then there is another prince who has come up and they want to marry off this prince, but they come across some kind of curse that the, the dragon must be married first. And so who is going to marry this dragon? And cutting to the end, ultimately, they do find a bride for him who who goes through this whole process on their wedding night of like stripping him of layers and layers. And she does as well um, until they get to the core of this dragon figure is, and it's just a, a scared individual who is then bathed in milk and honey and they live happily ever after. But I think it's a really beautiful story of how, you know, we do have, the, we do have ignorance. We're always invited into ignorance. We're always, and we're always invited into wisdom and we need compassion. We need people who will sit with us in our darkest moments, in our moments where we, we are our most demiurgic um, to, to be with us and to, to not only help us to strip back the layers, but also, also to bathe us in milk and honey and, and know that that does not need to be our final form. Beautiful. Wow, I, I'm really glad that you shared that because one, it's very powerful, but two, just to to see on the archetypical level how these these Gnostic metaphors just bubble up from us, right? And you know, we've talked before, me and Tony, about uh, Gnostic fairy tales, and you know, the most famous one being the Hymn of the Pearl, which very much is a fairy tale. So, but that that's beautiful. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, very very powerful message here. So we're we're at about the hour mark. Maybe we can go ten or fifteen minutes more. Is, is that is that cool? Um, because there's there's things I want to hear. Nick, can you 
uh, and if you could, uh, uh, as the kids say, explain it like I'm five. Uh, and I know this is difficult, but if you could talk a little bit about what Philema is quickly, if you, if you have a uh, if you have an elevator pitch, if you have an elevator summation, and kind of talk about some of your speculation on on this Corazon figure and and how it how it works as a, as a demiurgic figure. So if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think I can. Um, so no, I, I so I think Philema. A lot of people probably listening already know is is this magical and mystical philosophy that comes from the writings of Aleister Crowley. So you know, a lot of people tend to have opinions one way or the other about Crowley and Philema. Um, but one of the things that I think uh, it's important is that there are a lot of uh, you know, Philema is not coming out of nowhere. It obviously comes out of a long tradition of Western esotericism, and there are a lot of themes in it that, while I wouldn't necessarily describe it, um, you know directly as Gnostic in the sense of ancient Gnosticism at all. It, it clearly is a Gnostic religion in some sense. Um, and so for me, in terms of this topic, uh, one of the ways that um, Quran's in this figure in Philema has become really interesting is, and I'm not the first person to point this out, there's there's a really good article you can find online by a Kabbalist named Colin Lowe, who kind of trailblazed some of these ideas. But um, Quran's in is sometimes just seen as a figure that this dweller on the threshold that's part of your kind of personal spiritual path or you know, and it's like a very high level experience that you have to kind of pass pass through the abyss in this in this part of Crowley's system in the AA. Um, and that's where you encounter Karanzin. But Colin Lowe talks about how um, Karanzin, in, in terms of the hints in Crowley's writings, especially in the received writings uh, called The Vision and the Voice, which Crowley received um, in the desert. And it's kind of a really dramatic story of, of, you know, going through the Enochian ethers and that, that kind of magical operation. Karanzin actually, has all of these qualities that are clearly influenced by uh, writings about the Demiurge. So uh, one of the things Kronzin says is, I am I, at one point, which kind of directly relates Kronzin to some of these things in, in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, Kronzin, you know, is, is called the maker of forms, um, is given all of these motifs that come from Samael um, and kind of language about that. So it's pretty clear that Kronzin is this kind of Demiurgic figure. Uh, I think the thing that's really useful about that is uh, Karanzin as a demiurge is sort of a, a maker of worlds or a maker of forms. So uh, again, this conversation about it not being evil because you know we can't actually exist outside of manifestation in terms of forms, um, identities, you know, images. We have to live in X or human beings. But if we become ensnared by by one one of them and and kind of worshiping that rather than kind of seeing through that complex into like kind of with, with Rebecca saying in terms of like un taking off these layers. Um, I think that that's really the spiritual experience in some ways that Karanza represents in Thelema. Um, so you're you're encountering these kind of false forms that are not evil in themselves, but they are problematic if you think that that's where you stop. And then you know in the Crowley system, if you stop there, then you're you're considered part of the Black Brotherhood in Crowley, which is the kind of bad, scary people that get trapped in the abyss. <laughs> and so there's a whole mythology there. Um, but really, the 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 thing if you kind of pull the kernel out from that is you can only really cross this abyss. That Crowley's talking about if you can kind of take off all of those layers. Um, so you then kind of float across the abyss like a sheet of dust is the image that he uses because you've emptied all of yourself um, in a certain way. So the Karanzin kind of represents that that last like temptation in, in that way, but also is like it, it also seems to have identity with this demiurgic figure who um, kind of creates manifestation in some sense. Uh, so yeah, a lot of that's in the vision and the voice if you kind of read those those ethers where Crowley writes about that. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, and that ties in. Uh, I, I mean, I'm sure everybody else making the same connections, right? I mean, this is the Gnostic ascent that Father Tony was talking yeah. about, mm -hmm. <laughs> almost yeah. to a T. So, um, B, I, I had a question for you, which again, other people can can riff on. Uh, but like, so, uh, you, so jo Joanne's a, a lay leader um, in the the AJC. Father Tony is obviously a priest. I'm a deacon in the AJC. Uh, Nick uh, has um, a number of occult organizations that he's he's involved with. Um, so, were you? to to sounding crazy to being crazy people so but i'm i i'm wondering for you sort of sort of as an artist and, and you also sort of have a you have a numer you're a numerologist and you have sort of a witchy background right so like do you what what is people's reactions when you're trying to explain narcissism or to get them interested in it or to see it from the viewpoint of a witch or an artist and you're like oh by the way you know it's, there's this mythology about this insane ignorant ruler of the world that keeps us in this prison like what is what is that that like like when, when you're talking about the demiurge to to people who are not familiar with 
process and when you're sort of using the demiurge in this this non-religious um uh, i guess non-religious isn't the right word but you know what i mean in, in the context that you and divine spark are are, are doing which is, you know, different than some of the context we're we're doing. <laughs> yeah, lofty. Yes, um, I am a pretty eclectic witch. I definitely do not. Um, I am not tied to any kind of organization, although I do like to dabble in a lot of schools of thought. Um, so don't have no fear. I am definitely not a a stranger to be to speaking and having people go. What uh, are you sure? So I think I think though in the context of what you're what you're speaking about. Um, most people actually, when I bring up Gnosticism and and the myth are, are kind of quickly on board. And I, I'm not sure what that, <laughs> what that says uh, about where we all are. But I, I think that Gnosticism flourishes when empires die. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that it's, for me, where I'm coming from is uh, a lot of the the learning and unlearning that's already been spoken about is really what drew me to uh, this idea of Gnostic thought and and this idea that we are always constantly reviewing the stories that we tell ourselves and that we that we live that are that we're rooted in essentially that our values and and our communities are rooted in and so um, I, I I don't know that I have been met with with that much pushback, um, other than just folks not being interested in the conversation as a whole. Um, <laughs> but I have been kind of surprised that I think a lot of people are uh, really craving a different lens at this point in time and looking at alternative ways of of looking at some of the oldest stories in the world that, you know, that we are familiar with. And uh, of course, it's not as simple as uh, as we've already talked about with the Demiurge being the God of the Old Testament. But I, I even I even copped to right at the beginning that there was something about that shift of perspective that did kind of break things open for me and allowed me to go a little bit deeper with it in terms of, um, of just moving away from constructs that I was ready to move away from. And so I, I think people are ready. I, I, I haven't been met with as much pushback as I, I think you would, you would think. Very cool. Well, I, I think it is just about wrap up time. Unless uh, do we have any, anybody has anything else that they, they want to get off their chest on the topic or a thread that they want to pick up on. Does, does anybody have anything or uh, is this, this, this is a good point? Yeah. Okay. So this has been so awesome. Thank you. Please. This, we were hoping to do this monthly uh, on different topics. Come back anytime. Uh, for any of you who uh, tuned in late, uh, we're going to um, uh, archive this on YouTube. So so it will be there. Uh, it's also and... being saved on Twitch too, so they can watch it right now. Perfect, perfect. It'll be on Twitch. Um, I am hoping that uh, that there will be other moderators. I won't always be here, so th that's good for all those that are uh, sick of my voice. So, uh, but I already know what the next one is going to be. I don't know who the panel is yet. Maybe it'll be some people who are here tonight. But uh, October is spooky month, so we're going to be doing one on HP Lovecraft. So join us for October 2021. Um, and if you are listening or watching this past of uh, September and October 2021, then after you finish watching this, one you can watch the Lovecraft panel that we did. So, okay, everybody. The future is nice and not terrible. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Good night. Good night. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.